actually in industry this is a way they do um, do these analyses. So now you've got the cellobiase breakdown of paranitrophenyl glucoparinicide. You've got your enzyme comes in and it breaks it down. So, but what I'd mentioned before is students don't like clear things going to clear things. The paranitrophenyl in the reaction conditions which are acidic is still clear. However, if you change the conditions to a basic condition, then the paranitrophenyl has a resonant structure and now it's yellow. So this, this changing to a basic solution actually serves two purposes. The first thing, it develops the color of any paranitrophenyl that's present. But the second advantage is it actually stops the reaction. So now students can take time points of the reaction occurring. And each reaction time point can be directly compared to a standard that has a known concentration of paranitrophenyl. And um, they can do this either qualitatively, so if there isn't instrumentation, such as a spectrophotometer in the classroom, they can just visually compare their, we include in the kit a set of standards and they can visually compare. The eyeball is a free spectrophotometer that comes with the students. So the other methodology they can use is they can quanti uh, quantify the amount of um, yellow color using a spectrophotometer. So in this case, they can measure all of their standards, generate a standard curve, measure all their unknowns from a reaction, and, and um, calculate the amount of paranitrophenol. So again, this is an overview of um, the procedure in the kit. <coughs> Students add an enzyme or a buffer. We do like to in include controls with all of our kits um, so that students understand that if you, know, if you don't add any enzyme, this reaction isn't going to occur. Or potentially, they could also um, heat up that, that control um, reaction and see that, well, you know, there are other ways to put energy in and get a product out of this, but it doesn't occur in the same time frame. So they'll add their, their buffer or, or their enzyme to their substrate. They'll um, then take, di at different time points, they'll add that reaction to a stop solution and then either visually compare um, the results to their controls or they can use a spectrophotometer and generate a standard curve and then calculate their amounts. So again, this is the, uh, an example of the standard curve um, in which they're given known amounts. They learn to do serial dilutions, known amounts of paranitrophenol, um, do the absorbance, and graph it. Um, and so when they get their unknowns, they measure an absorbance, and then from that standard curve, they can calculate or, or graphically do an amount. And again, it's, it's up to the educator. We leave this, this, these kits technically, we've sold them actually middle school. They weren't really designed for middle school. Middle school all the way up through university. So the level of sophistication is depending on, on the student level and what the educational needs are. And then a, a key um, enzymatic analysis is calculating the initial rate. And so as you run out of substrate, as the reaction becomes substrate limited, your reaction rate will slow down. So we have students calculate where is the reaction linear, that at that point it's not substrate li uh, limited, and then they can calculate from that initial rate of reaction. However, in this kit we also include other um, variables that are very important when um, determining what can affect the rate of reaction. There are experiments and reagents in there to test the effects of temperature, the effects of pH, the effects of substrate concentration, the effects of enzyme concentration. And these are important because students tend to think, well, more is better, so if we want more product so we can make more ethanol, why don't we just crank the temperature up? And um, that does work. Um, actually, these enzymes are uh, quite thermophilic. Um, they tend to come from composting bacteria. But it's another important um, detail when teaching renewable energy. Well, how are you going to get that temperature really high? What are you going to do to get it that high? You're going to have to heat it. Where is the energy coming from to get that heat? So making sure that they understand all of the conditions that are required in order to get this reaction to work at faster um, conditions are important. And again, the effect of pH on the initial reaction, most of these um, uh, rumen bacteria that make these enzymes are in low, low pH, so if you increase the pH too much, um, the reaction slows down, but, you know, everyone would prefer to do reactions at neutral pH. It's easier on your plumbing, it's easier on your pipes, it's not necessarily an option. Um, 
Again, two more experiments that we include in the kit are the effect of substrate concentration on the reaction rate. Um, if you have more substrate, your initial reaction will be faster. Um, and if you have more substrate, you will have more product. However, if you think of what the substrate is for this, it's ground up wood bits and ground up corn stover. If you have too much substrate, it's just a thick mush, and it's really hard then to get to fusion. So again, it's another opportunity to have students think on a, on a wide scale as well as a very specific enzyme reaction scale. Um, and again, the effect of enzyme concentration on the reaction. If you have more enzyme initially, the reaction rate is faster, but if you have enough time, you eventually will get out to the same amount of, um, of product. It just will take time. For these reactions, again, it's another, another thinking point for students. The part that actually costs the most is the enzyme. So yes, you want more product faster, but if you're, all your input uh, financially then is into the enzyme, when you could just wait a little bit longer, potentially, and get the same result, it's just, again, another teaching point of, of thinking of biofuels and, and renewable energy on a, on a much larger scale. So the final experiment we include in this series is a mushroom extract. Um, we, do, we don't recommend going out and collecting field collection of mushrooms for safety <coughs> reasons, um, but things that you can get at the supermarket work great, and they're safe and edible. Um, again, we go down to middle school, and they like to um, <coughs> dare each other to eat things. So um, in this, students will extract, um, we include an extraction buffer in the kit, and they'll extract a solution from their mushrooms, they'll add that to the substrate, and they'll measure over time course how much product is produced, how much paranitrophenyl is produced from the artificial substrate, and they can calculate an initial rate of reaction. Again, it allows students to um, determine, well, maybe what is a, a better source? How do you go out and decide how can I get a new enzyme? How can I create a new enzyme? What factors make a certain mushroom live in a certain condition? and potentially like brown and white wood rot mushrooms, not ones you get at the supermarket, are great decomposers. They'd work great for this sort of production. Um, so for extensions, again, since the kit was designed for high school all the way through university, we do actually have some higher level extensions that are being used at um, community college and university level. One of them is to perform a complete michaelis menten analysis. Um, this particular analysis allows you to calculate a theoretical maximum rate of reaction as well as get a K, the, the Michaelis constant, which it's not an equal, equilibrium constant, but sometimes is considered conceptually to be similar to that. Um, and the, the point of this is to allow students to get an understanding of how is it that if I have enzyme A from this fungus and enzyme B from that bacteria, I want to design a plant and I know this one's more expensive than that, but maybe that one works better. So maybe it works better at a certain pH, a certain temperature. It's a way to compare apples and oranges. And um, so again, it's a, it's a much more um, complex conceptual um, experiment, but experimentally itself, it's, all that's being done is you change the substrate concentration and measure, and measure the difference in reaction rate, initial reaction rate. So experimentally, it's quite simple. Um, also, determining the optimum pH and temperature for the enzyme by preparing a temperature pH surface plot. A lot of, even, you know, in my educational experience, you always learn to do things single variably, single variably, test one variable, control everything else, and which is a very good way to do science. But at the same time, these plants, is from the earlier, um, diagram, you could see they're using multiple different enzymes at the same time. How do you optimize for all of those enzymes in there? One might have a higher pH and a lower temperature, or another might be completely degraded at a higher pH. So this allows multiple comparisons at the same time. And finally, we include um, an outline for a debate of the use of crops for cellulo cellulosic ethanol production. The DOE and, 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 and um, National Renewable Energy Lab, there's a huge push for cellulosic ethanol, um, but is it truly the solution? Um, we don't take a side as a company, um, but it, it, we, we offer a framework in which to discuss this. And again, in the framework here, of, there's lots of renewable energy sources, and, and so you know, how, how do we want to go about solving these problems? So this is just an example of michaelis menten analysis in which substrate concentration initial is varied and then the initial reaction rate is calculated 
and um, it asymptotically approaches the maximum velocity rate, but really the way to calculate the Michaelis constant and the, the maximum velocity is a double reciprocal plot, which is on the bottom. Um, and this is just an example for um, the enzyme included in the kit of a combined pH and temperature effect. Um, so again, just a pH effect is on the top. It's a single variable. But um, you know, maintaining pH, changing temperature, and then slowly ramping up the pH and, and generating the surface plot, students can determine what is the optimum for this one enzyme. So maybe you know, they can include that in a problem of how do I want to, you know, what will still work if I have a mixture of, of enzymes. And then finally, um, just a diagrammatic of, and, and this is hopefully a segue into the next talk too, of the use of cellula cellulosic ethanol as a fuel source. In talking with students when we developed this kit, there seemed to be a lot of confusion as to what is carbon neutral. Um, this idea that if you're burning ethanol, it's carbon neutral. Well, no. <laughs> you're burning it and you're producing carbon dioxide. It's just if that carbon dioxide gets sequestered by photosynthesis back into a plant, and cycled around, hopefully you can be neutral, but there's lots of other considerations in the production of, of um, cellulosic ethanol, such as the tractors that go out there. What are they going to burn as they're out there collecting switchgrass or collecting trees or collecting corn stover? Um, and trees themselves at nighttime during respiration, not photosynthesis, they're producing CO2 quite nicely themselves. Um, and then also the plant itself. How do you keep the plant carbon neutral? The energy input to heat up all of these reactions, the energy input to um, move fluids around within the plant. Um, and then finally, the carbon that's produced, the carbon dioxide that's produced once you, um, you actually burn the material, um, the, the, the eth ethanol, whether it be in trucks, transportation trucks to move the ethanol from one location to another, or in your vehicle, or in airplanes. Um, so. We include that as, as a discussion and, and just as, again, looking at things in a much more systematic way as a whole picture, not just a specific um, reaction. So. Well, thank you.